Robots sense things and they move around in response. That's pretty much the two main things that they do. For us to program this behavior though, we need a way to describe the position and orientation of the robot and other things around it. If you've ever tried to do this from scratch, you probably realize that once you have more than a couple of moving parts or you're working in 3D, it becomes really messy. At this point, you have two options. You either learn the mathematics and implement it yourself, or you get a library like the Ross Transform system, and then eventually realize that to use it properly, you need to understand the maths anyway. So what we want to do is to develop a language, a system, a set of mathematical concepts that will let us describe how a robot moves through space. And this is going to be the same way that Ross and any other library does it underneath. Some things that we're not thinking about right now are forces, torques, or even velocities. We're just going to focus on the position and rotation of the parts of the robot and other things around it. And we call these poses. The way we understand our robot will evolve as we explore these ideas, but let's start by imagining our robot as a series of points in space. Now, a single point doesn't capture the robot's size or rotation, and anything more complex will be too confusing for now. Describing the pros of our robot then becomes a matter of finding a function that takes a set of these initial points around the origin and spits out a new set of points that have moved to wherever the robot is. Once we've got our head wrapped around this idea of moving points around, we'll extend things by introducing the concept of coordinate systems and reference frames, which help to simplify some of the mathematics when dealing with more complex systems. Throughout these videos, we'll be representing points as a column vector. If our robot moves in a flat surface, we can treat the problem as 2D and our points will have an X and a Y component. Otherwise, full 3D points will have a Z component too. So now that we've got some points to represent our robot, let's look for a function that can manipulate them and make the robot move. It's worth spending a couple of minutes going back to basics on functions. Functions take an input, or sometimes multiple inputs, and spit out an output. For any unique set of inputs, you'll always get the same output out. The function's not going to spit out something different the next day. And the simplest functions that we use all the time work in one dimension. They take a single number, a scalar, as input, and have a single number as output. One example would be y equals x divided by 2 plus 1. This function takes the x values and transforms them or maps them to new values. Any x value you pick will have a corresponding y value as an output. We could look at some example values in a table, or we could plot it on two number lines where each value in the input has a corresponding value on the output. This can be a bit hard to interpret though, so we usually turn it into a 2D plane, where we have the horizontal axis representing the input value x, and the vertical axis representing the output value y, and then we can start to see the effect of the function visually. The next step up is functions with two inputs, or a 2D input, and a single output. For those, we can use a 3D plot. But that's still not enough for us. In real life, our robots don't live in a 1D world, they live in the real 3D world, or at best 2D if we can assume they're on a flat surface. So if we want to use mathematics to describe the movement of our robots in space, we need to be able to use functions in higher dimensions. The 2D equivalent of our function from before will be f of p equals p on 2 plus 1, where p is now a vector of values. If you try to plot this with a dimension for each input and output, you'll realize that you need four dimensions, which is unfortunately more than we have. So instead, we use the 2D version of that number line approach. We have a 2D plane representing the input and another one representing the output. Like with the number line, we can plot some test points as an input and then see where they land in the output space. To make things a bit more clear and concise, we usually plot these spaces on top of each other and use colors to differentiate them. And for 3D, we would then just have two 3D plots. What we just saw there was kind of scaling the points down, but that doesn't really happen to our robots. Of all the infinitely weird and wacky coordinate transformations we could come up with, the only two that we're interested in are rotation and translation. If you can see where this is going, then you might be thinking, hmm, rotation might be a bit hard, but translation is easy. You just have to add the offset. But we can't do that because there's an extra rule we're going to add after this break. It's all well and good to have your robot worked out in theory, but at some point you actually need to go and build it, which always comes with its own set of challenges. One way you can make this easier is using PCBWay. 
PCBWay can manufacture all kinds of PCBs for you, multi-layer, flexible, whatever. On top of that, they can source components, assemble the board, and they even provide services for CNC machining, 3D printing, and more. Make your next project easier by checking out PCBWay via the link in the description. As we saw, we could translate our robot by just adding an offset, but we're going to add the additional restriction that our transformation has to be linear, and that function isn't. For our purposes, a linear function is one that can be expressed in the form f of p equals a times p, where a is an n by n matrix and n is the number of dimensions in p. So basically the a matrix for the 1D, 2D and 3D cases respectively are going to look like this. A nonlinear function is anything else, which includes trying to add anything onto the end. It turns out with this extra rule, translations are actually much trickier than rotations. Just a quick warning, don't be fooled into thinking that a function like y equals mx plus b is linear just because it's a line. Being linear in the polynomial calculus sense is not the same as being a linear function or transformation, and that particular function is nonlinear due to the added b term. So we are on the hunt to find a matrix, a linear transformation, that will rotate and translate our points in space. Let's play around and see what we can find. We've got our input triangle here in red and the result in blue, but you can't see the red one because the matrix is currently set to the identity. This means the output will be the same as the input. If we leave the off diagonals as zero and start to change the first number, you'll see that this scales it in X and then changing the bottom right corner scales it in Y. That's because the top left element is how much X in affects X out and the bottom right is how much Y in is going to affect Y out. And then those off diagonal elements control how much y in affects x out and x in affects y out. To understand this, it's easiest to see it in practice. By leaving the other numbers as they started, we can adjust these one at a time, resulting in a shear or a skew transform. And with a little bit of fiddling, we can actually replicate something that resembles a rotation. You can see it here going all the way through to 90 degrees. And now the new X value is the negative of the old Y value and the new Y value is the old X value. If this is a bit confusing, don't worry too much. In the next video, we're going to really dig down and understand these rotations. At the moment, they're just some numbers. You'll also notice that no matter what we do, we can never translate it. Again, we'll solve that problem another day. But that's actually one of the key properties of a linear transformation. There are a bunch of special characteristics these functions have, but here are three. Zero always maps to zero. As we just saw, there's no way to move the origin. Secondly, linear transformations are always odd. f of minus p equals f of p. This results in a sort of mirroring effect. If you pick any point and see how it moves under the transformation, the point exactly opposite it through the origin will move the opposite way and will continue to be its mirror. You can sort of imagine there's a pin through the origin and everything is stretching and mirroring around it. Thirdly, linear transformations chain through multiplication. If we want to scale some points and then shear them and then rotate them, we can just multiply all the matrices together. Now this last point is extremely helpful. It doesn't just make the equations simpler on page, it also improves computation speed. Because we can pre-multiply all of the different matrices and then transform as many different points as we need to with one single final matrix multiplication. So the hunt is on. How do we use linear transformations to rotate and translate our robot mathematically? See if you can figure it out. To help you out, I've included a link in the description to a text version of this content. And at the bottom of the second post, you'll find a little tool where you can adjust the values inside the matrix and see what effect that's going to have on the different points. You'll also find there a link to a discussion thread where you can ask questions about this stuff. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video, and thanks to all the patrons who make this channel possible, especially Anonymous, Weekly Robotics, Joshua Craftgen, and Matt Williamson. If you want to see more like this, please consider joining up, and you'll also get access to the Discord server. See you in the next video!